Welcome everyone to the last Sunday business sermon of the year on better slide presentations. I've been doing webinars and online teaching and in-person classroom teaching uh, since the mid 2000s. I started actively doing online teaching in 2008, 2009, and I've been dealing with PowerPoint and slide making tools ever since. And uh, obviously with the pandemic, my online teaching has increased. Um, many people are getting more exposed uh, to tools like Zoom and other presentation styles. Uh, there are lots more tools than there used to be for online teaching and presentations. For the purposes of, of the next 30 to 60 minutes or so, I'll be focused on pretty traditional webinar style instruction um, through Zoom or GoToWebinar or similar platforms. But a lot of the things that I'm gonna be discussing do apply to in-person teaching environments as well if you're using visuals of any kind. So let's get started. Now, the, what we're, uh, the way that we're gonna move through the material is first I'm gonna give you five ways to instantly improve your slides. So you can go back to old slide presentations and improve them, or you can just keep these principles in mind as you move forward. I'm also going to talk about the big mistake that people make, the big mistake I made for years and years and years and years, and I'm so glad that I'm not making this mistake for the most part anymore. I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on image use because I find that particularly important for engagement, and then finally we'll wrap up with achieving a cohesive look, and we'll also, I'm sure, have plenty of time for your questions. So the, I already indicated why I think this matters. Uh, engagement for online teaching is really important because there are so many distractions. There are so many ways to multitask and do something else while someone is presenting. You, in fact, listening right now are probably multitasking, and I accept that. It's just kind of the world that we live in. So I don't try to fight against that too much. I mean, I certainly want to keep your attention, but one of, you know, one of the ways that I help keep people engaged and hopefully focused on what I'm talking about is that I keep the slides moving uh, in, in a, let's say, in pretty rapid succession. I, I'm thinking about having new visuals or having the screen refresh every few minutes. And so people will feel like they miss something if they turn away for too long. And I also like to make the slides really clear about what I'm covering at that particular moment, because there are times when people have justified reasons for maybe looking at something else or you know, engaging with email or loading a website. And so if they look back at the presentation live, uh, if they have a quick look at the slide, they know exactly where I'm at in the order of things. And if I'm back to the topic that they're interested in. So in any event, for online teaching, I think th considering how you're putting together these presentations and, and the way that people's attention might, <laughs> might wander, you, I'm always thinking about that, but uh, not because, not in a bad way. Um, I'm trying to make things valuable no matter how closely people are paying attention. All right, so the five things you can instantly do to improve your slides. Number one is to focus on one key point per slide. And I find this is one of the hardest things for people to do, especially those who have been using PowerPoint for years and years and years where they kind of put you into this default mindset that you're going to have like five bullet points per slide. Um, some people will actually put paragraphs and paragraphs of text on a slide and they'll make the font smaller to get it all in and then they'll just read off the slide. Um, I mean, there might be some occasions where that's appropriate, but there aren't many occasions where it's appropriate. So certainly I use slide packs myself um, to help me remember what I'm gonna be talking about. They're like memory triggers. Um, so it's for me as well as for the audience, but I would never wanna put exactly what I was gonna say like verbatim and put it on the slide and then recite it to people. Um, most slide presentation tools do have a notes section where you can actually, if you do want to have something written out because you want to be really precise and make sure you say the right thing, you can certainly do that without actually putting the text on the slide. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that, well, I'll get to that later. I'm going to hold that thought. 
So in in one of my presentations that I gave frequently several years ago, I had uh, it was about business models for writers, and I had a section on crowdfunding, and I used this slide a lot when I talked about crowdfunding. It is it is not a good slide. Uh, it is way too much information for one slide. And what would happen is that I would really rush through these points, um, feeling like, you know, feeling the weight of how much was here and that and, and, and how long I was spending on it and how boring it must be getting. Um, so this doesn't serve anyone when you're kind of rocketing through all of these points very quickly. It doesn't give people a lot of time to consider each one in isolation. And, and each of these points is really quite important for a successful crowdfunding campaign. We've got a point about the optimal campaign length. So you'd want to discuss why that is. Um, campaigns without a great reward fail. Uh, you'd want to talk about that. The pitch videos that are associated you know, there's lots that could be said about those pitch videos. So like each of these bullet points really deserves its own slide, um, if not multiple slides. Um, so this is some, this is what I mean when I talk about keep it to one point. It's okay to make a really short point with just a single slide. And then if you have related points, they don't all have to be stuffed onto the same canvas. You know, you, it's okay to break up related points. Um, as I said, but you can, I, I often shoot for some, somewhere between one to three minutes per slide. It really depends on the presentation, but I like to keep things advancing and to have these headline points, as you can see. That said, there are times when a single slide with a bulleted list works. Uh, sometimes you'll want the bullets to advance as you go so that people aren't kind of jumping ahead of you and they're just focused on what you want them to focus on. So you can consider showing one bullet at a time with, uh, they're usually called animations. Uh, that, I think they're called animations in Keynote. Um, I think bulleted lists work really well for resource lists or examples where you're not necessarily discussing each and every single like resource, but you're saying, here are the things that you should take a look at, and people will go explore them likely after the presentation. Uh, but if each bullet is a complex idea, then it might deserve its own slide. So always consider that anytime you've got a bulleted list. Now, when you do have a, some complex information that you're imparting, Sometimes, like if it's like do's, don'ts, compare, contrast, A versus B or C or D, um, have a chart. Uh, so if you have a lot of information, like you see on this particular slide is when I talk about the differences between the business model of self-published authors and traditionally published authors. It is more information than I would typically have on a slide, but it's really nice to talk about these issues with this visual contrast and this separation. And then it also becomes later on, if you give students access to your slides or participants, if you give them your slide pack, you know, this becomes really wonderful in terms of a handout, reminders, uh, it, the curriculum right there, super valuable for people after the fact. I personally love infographics, but not all infographics are created alike. <laughs> Some of them are just, it's, it's an assault. It, they're trying to say or accomplish too much. They're crowded. Um, it's unclear what story they're trying to tell. So for an example, I found one, uh, this has nothing to do with publishing, but this infographic on the left about employment uh, from, from many years ago, it's, it's trying to do way too much at least for a, a presentation like the one I'm delivering. It, this might be okay, maybe in a magazine or something. On the right, we have an example of an infographic that is very, I think, simple and clear. It's showing the sales trajectory of young adult fiction from 2013 to 2021. And the message here is that YA growth is driven by backlists. So this infographic gives me an opportunity to talk about that trend um, and what's happening in that market. And it's assisted by the graph. 
All right. So number two, and this is the big mistake uh, that people make, not having a headline on the slide or just having a super, super vague headline. And this is the thing that I am terribly guilty of. Um, so you can, like, if you only take one piece of advice from today's presentation, please take this one. Number two, put the big takeaway in the slide headline. You don't want to bury it or think that you're saving the best for verbal delivery. Instead, you want to make the point clear at the top and then explain and elaborate and show examples supporting the point. So here on the left, you'll see a slide that I've used in my class about email newsletters about the merits of using plain text. And for a long time, the headline was just using plain text, but it's not particularly informative or it's not making a point. So to make it stronger, I now use marketing experts swear by plain text in email newsletters, which I hope, you know, kind of sparks curiosity or like, why is that? And so that gives me an opportunity to discuss why that is. And if, if you as a writer might want to consider using plain text in your email newsletter. And for those who are wondering, I mean, there's no right answer here. <laughs> I myself don't use plain text. Uh, just, it just depends as so many things do. Number three has to do with varying your slide layouts. Now, earlier I talked about how if you were an early PowerPoint user, and still today, frankly, if you're a PowerPoint user, you kind of get into this default slide layout of headline, point, 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 point. And that doesn't necessarily serve your presentation all that well to just repeat that again and again and again, especially if you're loading those bullet points with lots of really meaty concepts that should really be broken up across the presentation. So you can do so much better if you just vary the layouts that you're using. Um, and some people don't even realize, in fact, that whatever template or theme, you know, they're working from has usually six, 10, 12, or more different templates to be that you can choose from. Some of them are meant to include images. Some of them are meant to be comparisons. Some of them are meant to be quotes. So there are lots of different variations. And in fact, you should probably choose uh, a slide theme or template that has the sort of layouts that best benefit your teaching style or the sorts of content that you put on your slides. Now, here is an example of my very first webinar slides. They are pretty sad. Um, now, granted, I think as like as a handout, like if this was just going to be part of a handout that I gave people after the fact, I think it works pretty well, but as a a live presentation online, it's, it's not so exciting. Uh, and it's black, obviously. Now, my slides include, obviously, a lot of images. Um, and one of the things I would suggest doing when you're thinking about slide layout and, and having some diversity in, in the material is go to the uh, is it, it's usually called slide table or it's the slide sorter where you get that bird's eye view of all of your slides. And so like, as you can see here, and you can like make the slides larger or smaller, but the key is that you can see many, many, many slides at once. And that will give you a real sense if you're falling into a rut. And also just the kind of the flow of the presentation and if where you've got the breaks and how long you're spending on each topic. This is a really powerful way to look at your entire presentation, and you should definitely do it. It's how I um, edit and rethink each of my presentations before I give them is by going to that bird's eye view of all the slides. Okay, number four, use images. Use images, use images. Um, now, sometimes images are just you know, they're just for visual interest and they might not actually have a really important purpose to play other than keeping, 
you know, keeping people's attention or providing something that catches the eye to make people aware, hey, the slides are changing now, <laughs> pay attention. Um, that's what this image is doing. It doesn't necessarily have a whole lot of import other than we've changed the slide and there's now a new image. But obviously there are many times when images help teach. And so they can be direct examples of things or illustrations of the ideas or the concepts. So often when I talk about how to get published, I talk about the different types of fiction and nonfiction categories in the marketplace and how to think about these categories. For a long time, I used the slide on the left, which was just this bulleted list. And I took some screen captures of Amazon categories, which isn't particularly that helpful. Uh, it was a little lazy. Now, when I talk about nonfiction categories, I, you'll notice I have a better headline on it, that nonfiction falls into two buckets. You've got narratives or stories and then everything else. And then I use actual book covers to help people see exactly what I mean by that um, with some, uh, some captions to clarify what sort of books they are. Images can also be used as visual metaphors for what you're discussing. Uh, I have a talk that I give on learning to stay in the game, even when everything is telling you to quit or you're, you're feeling defeated. Um, and I talk about, well, how can you be the exception, the person who basically makes it when so many other people drop out of the game. And so I found this image of you know a, a single red chair, I'm sure it's been photoshopped uh, in a sea of green chairs. Images can also help unify the presentation if you're using like the same idea or concept or um, animal <laughs> throughout, they can help tell the story. So I have a business models, uh, business models for writers presentation that has a cat theme running through it since I'm a cat person. And so we've got the cat sitting on a pile of money. We've got the cat napping while they earn money. So, you know, earning money while you sleep. And then we've got the, the cat hard at work at the keyboard doing non-scalable work. So um, not every presentation is going to, well, you, you won't be able to do this for everything, but when you have something um, like this, it, it can be, people start looking forward to what's coming next. And that's a good thing. And one of my favorite uses for images is just to add humor. Um, I'll talk about how to search for images in a second, but when I was doing some research for a presentation on platform building, I ran across this um, knitting project for introverts. I don't think I don't think it's a real knitting project, but uh, you you always get a laugh out of out of visuals like this, and it it just it helps increase engagement and attention. If you have a good visual, something that is really remarkable in what it demonstrates, go big with it. It's always frustrating to me when I see a presentation where they do have like a really interesting visual or infographic, infographic or chart, but it's gotten kind of shoehorned into some small square because they're using a bad template or something. And so you've got a little bit of text and then this small little image and you can't really see everything you would like to see. So if you have a good visual, go big with it. Let it take up the entire slide. Um, and people will be very grateful for that. Sometimes I also use very informal images. I'm not uh, always polished with the sort of, sort of images I use. Um, there's a talk I give on platform building where I tell my own personal story of building platform and I have some hand-drawn images in there, also some meme images. Meme images are another favorite. Um, and you know, it's, it's cobbled together. It's a little rough around the edges, but it really makes the point that I'm trying to make in the presentation and people really appreciate it. Okay, so that's, that. before I talk about how to find images, I do wanna say it's okay to have a slide that's only text. Uh, usually I save that, this sort of style for really, really important points. 
for section breaks, just for breathers, like if I'm going to take a break and do a little Q&A or if there's a rest period of some kind during a long presentation, you know, it, it's fine just to have a slide with text. You don't have to add an image to every single slide. All right, so if you're wondering how to find images or you, you, this is something you struggle with, I think Google is a wonderful first step. So just go to Google and think about the idea or feeling or psychology of what you wanna convey. I think it's harder sometimes to find images that are about abstract concepts, like feeling rushed. Um, it's more straightforward when you're just looking for something like, cats and money, like for that presentation with business models. I just looked for cats and money, cats and work, uh, and it didn't take me long before I was able to find lots of different options. So Google's a good for just brainstorming what might work, but you have to be careful because obviously all of the images that Google turns up are not just yours for the taking. Uh, if we're thinking about permissions, some of them are, are under copyright and you can't or you shouldn't just pick them up and put them into your presentation. But still, it can be usually whatever you find through a Google image search, you can probably find something really comparable um, through places that, were, that are permissions free. Now notice, I just wanna make sure everyone sees this. It's very important. When I run this search on Google, I'm going over to the images tab. So make sure that you switch over to the images. Um, and it, you also have some tools under the Google image search. If you look uh, under the little microphone icon, it's like about two thirds of the way over. If you click on tools, there are other ways that you can restrict or narrow the search. You can actually ask Google to just look for uh, creative commons images, which means you can use them without permission. Uh, under certain circumstances. So you could try doing that here. Uh, you can also search by size or resolution uh, and some other factors. So it's really, really, I find the, one of the most powerful tools I use for sourcing images and getting ideas. Once I kind of have a sense of what I want to put in the presentation uh, from Google or elsewhere, then I go to sites that have permissions free images where I don't have to pay. So here in this list, it's just a really quick sketch of some of the first steps, but there are like dozens, if not hundreds, if not thousands of these sites out there. Um, it's, and you'll find the ones that best suit your style or aesthetic or what sort of images you're looking for. And obviously there's so many different paid stock image sites where you're paying a very small fee for your images, like a dollar an image, if that even less, if you're buying uh, like packages uh, of credits at a time. Number five, um, and the last one in my list of five ways to immediately improve your slides is get to the good stuff earlier in your presentation, I find that our, this, this particularly applies when you have in-person stuff that you're transitioning to online, um, because in person you might have icebreakers or exercises, or um, you might talk a bit about your own background or work, like some introductory material about yourself. But online, usually that is a huge mistake because people, like I said, they're not always strictly paying attention. They want you to get to the good stuff. Part, part of your audience will just want to be entertained. Um, and so you want to give them, you know, the dessert, some of the dessert, not all of the dessert <laughs> right up there in the beginning so that they have, they see, oh, this person has the goods, you know, they really are going to offer a packed presentation that's going to um, be beneficial or, or, or funny or whatever it is, whatever the end goal of your presentation is. So as you, I hope, remember, unless you joined late, at the beginning of this slide presentation, I told you, you're going to immediately get five ways to improve your slides. And I'm going to tell you about the big mistake that people make in their slide design. So I hope, I hope you see how I, I use that to keep you here. Um, and if you were immediately bored, then I, I admit that I have failed. 
Okay, so what we're doing next, the last little bit here is achieving a cohesive look. And this is actually the easiest part. So number one, I would choose a color palette you're going to use either for the presentation that you're designing, or you could apply it to all of your presentations. As you've seen in my own examples again and again and again, I like white backgrounds and black type. Um, you don't really get more simple than that. And I like it because it allows me lots of flexibility in choosing images, and I don't have to worry about matching colors or aesthetics. Everything goes with black and white. So for me, this is a time-saving maneuver. I don't have to think about each presentation's design as aesthetic. Uh, it's, it's, for me, it, it makes um, choosing images a lot more straightforward. That said, there are times when you may want to have something that's, uh, that's a little more complicated and that ties in with something specific like a book launch. So if you're doing events in support of a book, you may want to generate a color palette that ties into the book cover. You can do this through lots of different sites. Um, I've got a couple examples here on the slide. And then you'll also want to choose the fonts you're going to use and stick to those fonts. Do not keep changing it up to be creative. You want to usually pick one or two, definitely no more than three. Um, there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong in terms of mixing serif and sans serif. Um, but if you're working with a theme or a template in PowerPoint or Keynote, usually the fonts have already been selected for you. I would just probably stick with the font selections. They're probably pretty decent um, and not stray too far outside of you know, how they've set it up. If you're starting from scratch though, you know, just there are actually sites out there that help you match fonts, uh, like pick font combinations. So you might wanna go and do that if you're not confident about your own selections. All right, so throughout the presentation, I've talked about using a theme or a template. So all of the major slide design tools like Keynote, PowerPoint, Google Slides, and Canva, they all have themes you can start with. And I, in fact, I suggest starting with one of these instead of starting from scratch. Um, you know, Keynote in particular has really clean, simple themes that I think it's easy for your stuff to look good. PowerPoint, I think, gets a little more questionable, um, although I haven't seen like I don't have the most recent version of PowerPoint, so it's possible they've improved their templates since I last looked. But I find the PowerPoint uh, templates unsurprisingly to be more corporate, um, maybe a little less modern or contemporary. So just be aware of that. I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily going to be bad, but I also don't think the PowerPoint templates are always all that flexible in terms of image use. So you might feel some constraints there if you're using PowerPoint. Uh, Keynote is an Apple only software. It comes free for Mac users. If you have a choice between Keynote and PowerPoint, I really encourage you to use Keynote. If you wanna get away from PowerPoint, but you're not an Apple user, I would take a look maybe at Google Slides and maybe Canva. I had a look at their slide templates. You just have to be careful. Because in Canva, what I noticed is that the themes are overly designed um, and the font is really small or the type size is really small. So if you're going to choose one of uh, these Canva templates or maybe you're going out into the third party market for a template, there are many out there, just make sure that you're choosing something that's not going to work you into a corner in terms of small font size that you're going to constantly have to bump up or that the aesthetic is so strong that when you start adding images it starts to look crappy so you know for the the template i'm showing you here from canva that it's very yellow and we've got those images i mean one of the reasons this looks so good right here like their default is because all of the images are kind of similar in style and aesthetic and color palette so if your images are kind of all over the place and not like that, um, 
it, the presentation starts to look less cohesive, not bad, just less cohesive. So the more colors, the more complexity in the theme, the bigger challenge it is, it is for you to keep it all together and looking like it's all in the same presentation style. All right, so that's the end of my formal comments that I wanted to talk about in terms of better slide presentation. Um, I'm now going to stop the share, have a drink of water and take a look at the Q&A box. So one of the first questions that came through is from an anonymous uh, person who wonders if there's a best size to scan photos for a slide presentation. How do you know a photo will work as a slide? It's pretty rare that I would scan a photo for use in a slide presentation. I mean, I've done it like for old family photos, um, but I would say, you'll probably be scanning at 300 DPI. I think 72 DPI would be the minimum. Um, but unless you're going to be using that photo for the entirety of the slide, I think probably just about any resolution you scan at is going to be workable. Uh, Kayleen says she tried to add audio to her PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> but the person who, uh, who hired me didn't know how to implement it. Uh, so we skipped it. So do I know how to fix the audio problem? And she uses PowerPoint via Zoom. Um, I have heard about people using PowerPoint and recording the audio over it. Um, I'm afraid I don't have any firsthand experience with that, <laughs> with that functionality. Uh, when I was recording voiceovers for slide presentations like this one, I would actually use a tool like Camtasia uh, another one would be ScreenFlow. You can actually use Zoom as well, just to, without any attendees, you can just pop open Zoom and start recording yourself and record the screen and record it that way so that it uh, end up, what you end up with is a, an MP4 file. I don't know what sort of file pops out the other end with a recorded audio PowerPoint. Maybe those who are attending uh, can speak to that if they're knowledgeable on it. But to me, that's... I don't know, there's something about me that resists that functionality because I don't, it, it feels a little clunky. I would have to really know what the use case is there for doing that instead of using ScreenFlow or just pop, popping open Zoom to record your presentation. All right, David says, uh, how does your, slide advice play against multicultural or nat national presentations? What cautions would you provide in this space? So I think, David, you're asking maybe how would slide presentation styles differ um, in the US versus Europe versus Asia? And I'm afraid I just don't have enough experience to draw on to, to tell you that. Um, I, I present mostly to Western audiences, people in the US, Canada, North America, Europe, and I have limited experience presenting for other nationalities. But I can tell you that my presentations and my classes attract people from all over the world, although they're typically English speaking Westerners. So I wish I could tell you something on that front, but I, I don't have a good answer for you. Okay. Karen asks, uh, as a total beginner on Keynote, is there a good basic template you'd suggest? Um, I would say look at the portfolio. I, I don't remember if it's called modern portfolio or just portfolio. That's the one I use. I think it's very simple to get started and you can make it look like you with some very simple customizations. I would stick to the keynote templates that are like kind of in the top half. Usually as you scroll down their template selection, they get more designerly and a little more fussy and a little more um, unforgiving of different types of images. So, you know, Things that don't have a background color are easier if you're just starting out, and I would suggest for a beginner. And Karen's also wondering if I have any info for authors with social media and newsletter design. I, I mean, I would not use Keynote for your social media or newsletter design, um, but if you're wondering about how to get better at that, I think Canva is a good starting point. 
And you could also think about, are you have to start thinking about your whole branding across all of your different touch points. So your social, well, not your social media, but your email newsletter and your website, your business card, any other touch points you have, ideally you're using the same sort of color scheme and fonts, um, headshots, and that, you know, they all feel like they came from the same place. Uh, Cindy asks, how do you embed videos? Uh, I can speak to that from a keynote perspective. All you have to do is locate the video you want to embed and just drag it into the presentation. That is it. That's how easy it is. And then keynote allows you to have the video start wherever you want. Like if you want to start two minutes in, you can do that. Um, you can control whether it plays on slide advance or when you click. And there, then there are some other ways that you can modify its behavior. So with Keynote, it's simple. Um, but unfortunately, I can't say for PowerPoint how difficult it might be. Although I imagine at this point, it's probably a drag and drop sort of functionality. As someone says, I've heard with Zoom, always put text on the left since the speaker is usually shown in the upper right. I feel like that's my husband, Mark, secretly getting into the Q&A and saying that because uh, he always asks our presenters, please don't put anything important in the upper right hand corner of your slides because it will get obliterated uh, during the recording. And he's right. So if, if you are frequently presenting on Zoom, keep that in mind. Uh, another comment, I have to present a slideshow uh, on an architect and have taken numerous photos of her in buildings. In such a case, are captions helpful? Um, I mean, if I, I'd have to know what the purpose of the captions are. Um, if, we're, if we were just talking about like credit lines or uh, simple information, I don't know that that's like this. Obviously, the smaller the type gets on a slide, the more it's going to be totally disregarded or not read. People will watch present online presentations on their phone, on their tablet. Um, you can't always read what's on a slide when the when the font gets below 12 point. Um, so I would just think about, do you, do you need that caption? Would it be better to have that information um, in some sort of supplementary document if it's important? I don't know. It, it just depends, I think, on your audience and if they're looking at what information they're looking for or expecting. Um, there was one presentation I gave some years ago at the Muse in the Marketplace that was heavy on history and other information that I felt like I needed to cite my sources. And so I did cite my sources um, in a slide at the end of the presentation um, that people would have access to afterward. For, so for those sticklers in the audience who wanted to see where I got my facts from, they could then take a look at that. But ordinarily, I, I wouldn't do it. Uh, Stan asks, how about embedding short videos? Uh, my earlier advice applies to that. So it doesn't matter how long the video is, you're going to have, it's, it's the same process. Um, as far as the, whether you should or not, maybe that's part of the question here. Um, I think videos add a wonderful uh, aspect to any pre online presentation, as long as they're short. So I would say, I would, I would caution you, you know, I don't, I don't know that I would include a video that's beyond three to five minutes, unless there's a really compelling reason, or that's somehow part of what people are expecting from the presentation. Um, so that's, it, and uh, yeah, so I'll just stop there since I would have to know more about the context to offer any more guidance. Um, Melissa says, do you worry about matching fonts from your website with your presentation? I do not. Um, I'm trying to think about if I should, but I don't think it's necessary. I, for the presentations, it's for me, it's more about clarity, making things easy to read. And on my website, I use Georgia. In my newsletter, I use Georgia. Georgia is like my brand font, but I don't find it terribly easy to read on a slide. So I haven't been using it on slides. If, it, if there is a match, by all means match. Um, if you're using uh, like a sans serif on your site, I don't, um, and you're using a sans serif in your presentation and they're very readable and clear, by all means match them. 
Okay. So I'm just checking out uh, the chat to see if there's anything I missed. Hold on. Oh, Christine makes a good point, Matt. Uh, a good point about uh, the black and white color scheme I use. Another reason that I've used it that I didn't mention is that it's really helpful for people if they're going to be printing out your slides. And I run into that frequently. Um, so that's another reason for the really um, meat and potatoes sessions that I do, meaning it's not a keynote inspiration talk, but if it's like teaching you how to write a query or it's teaching you, you know, how to do an email newsletter. I like having that white background because it just makes it that much easier for people to print stuff out if they want to. Uh, Kayleen says, I, I try to choose large sizes of text for in-person for people in the back of the room and that's not needed for virtual. Um, definitely in-person, you definitely think about that visibility from the back of the room. Online though, I would just add, so many people join on their phones or their tablets and that slide is pretty darn small so just be cognizant that we're not all on these like like i have a 24 inch imac and the slides look beautiful but as they get smaller it's uh the, the readability is challenged uh let's see patricia mentions that some of your audience members might be colorblind especially red green that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, and then Cindy says the red seat in that slide I showed earlier is not Photoshop. The red seat is at Fenway Park. It's the spot where Ted Williams hit the longest home run. <laughs> okay, so I stand corrected. Um, sports fans everywhere or horrified that I suggested. I think that that would have been Photoshopped. Uh, shows you how much I know about sports. Um, thank you, Cindy. Now I, now I know. Um, Excellent. So I'm just seeing if there's, I feel like there was a question I missed somewhere. I remember seeing it when I first jumped on. Hold on. I just want to see if um, I ask. Oh yes, Ruth. Um, Ruth asked, I'd like to know how, how to better engage, for instance, through surveys, videos. And I realized that I, in this presentation, I didn't necessarily talk about the ways you can engage with people in an online presentation and in person too. Um, I would say instant polling and surveys during a class can be really effective, um, but you have to keep it simple. So, you know, you don't want to get into a really complicated survey or polling technique. It's really good for things with definitive answers, like yes, no, or like one, two, or three, like just where people don't even have to think about answering. They just answer. So I think some of you probably know that Zoom has a polling functionality. I haven't used it that often, just on occasion, but it is really useful for instructors who want to get the feel of a room and to understand, you know, well, how many are published? How many are unpublished? How many are romance? How many are mystery? Um, and you can also do this through the raise hand function in Zoom. So not everything requires a poll. You can also ask people to raise their hand and answer to a question. Um, it's also very popular with my instructors for them to say, put in the chat what you are most worried about or what the biggest problem you have or the biggest question you have um, so that they can be more attuned to what their, where their audience is with the topic. And that often happens at the beginning and also at the end. Um, there are some people who are able to effectively do small group work during Zoom presentations, um, but this is usually, I don't think it's available for webinars, but for Zoom meetings, um, there are breakout rooms that you can create and sometimes, especially with writing, uh, there can be a uh, good cause to have small breakout rooms and I, I know that's popular with university teachers in particular, but I don't typically use it for my classes. Okay. All right. So I think I've covered everything for the folks who are joining me here in Zoom. I'm just going to quickly check Facebook and see if anyone has dropped in. Give me a second. Let's see if there are any questions that I might address. Doesn't look like it. So I'll just end by saying that I don't have any new 
sermons scheduled for the rest of 2021. I do plan to have more in 2022. I've also started something called the Business Clinic, which is another series of free sessions. You can find out more at my website. I just did the first Business Clinic uh, last week uh, that focused on author website redesigns and relaunches. And you can find that at my YouTube channel. And then uh, paid classes continue as usual. And you can find those at janefriedman.com slash online classes. So I hope you found something useful you can use right away for your presentations. It's some, it's a practice that I'm continually, you know, uh, I'm trying to improve uh, what I do on my own um, and find better ways to inform and educate through online teaching. So this is like the best of what I have discovered, uh, especially within the last three to five years. So thank you again for coming and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye, everyone.